There, quite simply, is no country that has done coach building as well as Italy. None. Pininfarina, Zagato, Batoni, names of houses, but also bywords for beauty. However, there is one that focused not just on beauty, but speed. Touring Superleggera. And here's what we reckon were their very best. And if you do like this video, don't forget to give it a like and then, you know, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell what's a doodle. And then let's move on and talk about a stunning Alfa Romeo. This was one of Touring Superleggera's earliest and perhaps most memorable designs. It wasn't the only flying star creation. In fact, there were several, all based on the Alfa Romeo 6C1750 or the Isotta Freschini 8B. The Alfa was powered by the firm's Mille Emilia winning Straight 6 and was built specifically for the 1931 Concorso d'Eleganza Villa d'Este. Yep, Villa d'Este has been running for that long. And it won, having been presented by the famous socialite of the day model Josette Pozzo. It had stunning white coachwork, featuring some very heavy striped gashes and an extraordinarily curved rear arch. And it had a matching white interior with a bold nickel-plated dashboard. You quite simply couldn't miss it. This, let's be honest, is quite possibly the prettiest car that a BMW logo has ever been put on. Motor racing was a great source of national pride in the interwar period. Britain, France and Italy all vied for honours while inevitably the Germans tended to win. While the German nation had conquered Grand Prix racing by the latter part of the 30s, sports car racing hadn't seen quite the same successes. So Prince Max zu schamburg lupper commissioned Touring to go create something slippery and fast based on the BMW 328. Working without a wind tunnel, Touring was still able to produce a design that was not only quite frankly gorgeous, but also remarkably efficient. On its competition debut at the small order of the Le Mans 24 hours, it won its class, averaging 82 miles an hour, and it finished fifth overall. But perhaps its most famous victory was in the race the name of which the car bears. The Mille Emilia had been reinstated for 1940 after being cancelled by Mussolini himself following a crash in 1938 that killed a number of spectators. But rather than a massive 1,000 mile loop, this was a nine lap race around a 62 mile triangular course, and it was renamed the Grand Prix of Brescia. With the race still going ahead, as the Italians hadn't quite entered the war yet, officially, the 328 was entered directly by ONS, the German national sporting body, and driven by the delightfully Germanly named Fritz Husker von Hanstein and Walter Baumer. The race was planned with typical precision, and the touring body car was faultless, averaging 108 miles an hour and finishing more than 15 minutes clear of the second-placed Alfa Romeo. Touring Superleggera actually designed the coachwork for Enzo Ferrari's first ever car. But that wasn't a Ferrari. It was the very catchy Auto Avio Construzione 815. So when the then relatively young Enzo started a company in his own name, Touring was the logical choice to clothe its first road car. This first Ferrari GT car, the 166 Inter, was presented at the Paris Motor Show in 1949 as a two-door coupe. Underneath, it had a lot of the innards that had gone into the first properly successful Ferrari race car, the 166 MM. There was an Aurelio Lampredi designed tube frame chassis with double wishbone and live axle suspension, but with a longer wheelbase for a little more comfort and space. Power came from a 2 litre version of the Colombo V12 that powered the racing cars with 110 horsepower and gave the car its name. Ferrari race cars of the time, of course, were named after the volume of an individual cylinder in CC, but you knew that, didn't you? It's a flying saucer. Literally, that's what Disco Volante means, flying saucer. It was also the name of Emilio Largo's hydrofoil yacht in the James Bond film Thunderball, but I digress. This stunning Alfa Romeo had a biconvex cross section when viewed from either side or front, which is why it was named so. And as an aside, biconvex just means convex on both sides, but it's my new favorite word. It was created as an experimental sports racing car and refined in a wind tunnel. 
even the underbody was fed in to reduce drag and its susceptibility to crosswinds. Three were built in 1952, all open-topped and powered by an alloy-blocked development of the 2.0-litre inline-4 from the Alfa Romeo 1900. The 1900 had been Alfa's first car to be put together on a proper production line, and its power aligned with the revolutionary shape meant the Disco Volante could hit 140 miles an hour. Two more cars were later added to the collection. These used the slightly more interesting 3.5-litre straight 6 from the Alfa Romeo 6C. Of the three original cars, one has remained as it was. One was converted into a rather awkward coupe, and the other was given a more conventional body in order to be used for racing. Touring also produced a modern take on the Disco Volante in 2013, based on the 8C, and it was very nearly as pretty as the original. Before we move on, we'd just like to take a second to say thank you very much for watching this video. We really do appreciate we're not just saying that. And if you do enjoy it, please do hit that like button. And then we'll talk about a non-Italian touring superleggera. See? Touring could reach out beyond just Italian brands. In fact, such is Touring Superleggera's connection with Aston Martin, it feels mean to single out just one creation. But it is the DB4 that just about sneaks ahead of the DB5 and DB6 for its pure simplicity of design. Touring created three spider versions of the DB2-4 that preceded the DB4 back in 1955. And after David Brown and the team saw them, the company was invited to have a go at penning the next Aston Martin. When it did unveil the DB4 at the London Motor Show in 1958, it caused a sensation. Built on a platform chassis, the DB4 was powered by a brand new 240 horsepower 3.7 litre double overhead cam straight six, designed by the legendary Polish racing driver Tadek Marek. Today, the cars rebodied by Zagato might get the most attention, but there is no denying that the standard DB4, with the word Superleggera artfully placed on its bonnet, is pretty much perfect. So important was touring to the development of Aston Martin that the company now uses the name Superleggera on its flagship production car, the DBS. And there's going to be some angry fans of the Aurelia, but the Flaminia GT might be Lancia's finest looking Gran Turismo. There, I said it. It's written in the script, don't blame me. The Flaminia was Lancia's flagship model, sold as a production saloon and coupe which were designed by Pininfarina. But it is the limited edition GT and Cabriolet that did proper justice to the incredible engineering underneath from Lancia. Bodied with aluminium, the touring design cars can be distinguished quickly by their four round headlights, where the standard models had two. They also had a shorter wheelbase, making them strictly two-seater affairs. The engine was the Francesco Di Virgilio designed Lancia V6 with a sophisticated suspension setup of double wishbone front and De Dion rear. In the end, the Flaminia may have been nice, but the Flaminia GT was the one chosen by film stars and royalty. Yep, Touring Superleggera created both the first road-going Ferrari and the first production Lamborghini. Uh, yes, yes, tractors, etc, etc. Lamborghini car. The 350 GT was essentially a production version of the stunning Lamborghini 350 GTV prototype designed by Franco Scaglioni. In order to roadify it, the Giotto Bizzarini designed race-ready 400 horsepower V12, which revved to a nutty 11,000 RPM, was civilised. It lost its dry sump lubrication system and came down to just 280 horsepower. The lightweight racing chassis also had some alterations. It was strengthened to greatly aid the refinement on road. Production chassis were originally built by Neri and Bonaccini and later Marchese before being sent to the touring works to be clothed in some super leggera bodywork and finalised at the Lamborghini plant. People who love Jensen interceptors really love Jensen interceptors. In fact, Jensen has been brought back from the dead three times in three different decades, most recently within the last decade or so. Originally, it was a pretty simple idea. Take a grunty US V8 and stick it in a dramatically styled coupe, or a personal luxury coupe, to use the vernacular of the time. So, power came from a Chrysler big block, 
originally a 6.3 litre unit which produced around 330 horsepower, while styling was by Touring, the bodies were originally made by Vignale, although they would eventually be made by Jensen itself. The Jensen had solid proportions and a wraparound rear window, which some say was inspired by the Brazilian-built Brasinca Uripuru, and let's be honest, you can see why. It would also become one of the first production four-wheel drive cars. The Jensen FF, meaning Ferguson Formula, had a four-wheel drive system developed by Ferguson, a company that made tractors and also made the first four-wheel drive Formula 1 car, as you do. It also had anti-lock brakes and a very rudimentary form of traction control. Fancy. Well, that's eight cars from Touring Superleggera that we think are absolutely bloody lovely. But what do you remember? What do you think's best? Let us know in the comments below.